So this morning, as I promised yesterday, it would be more of a seminar than a lecture. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, of course, the, I still would very much welcome question on the fly so that we can interact as much as possible. So the subject I want to present is um, the work we are doing here for with Maria and Simone who are sitting in the audience and team regarding the uh, translocation of biopolymer in, uh, in nanopores or in membranes. So uh, from the point of view of uh, multiscale, we can classify this uh, application. This is a real research project. I mean, it's ongoing research, so it's not uh, totally consolidated, but hopefully we'll convey the feeling for what one can do with multiscale techniques in this, in this field. So essentially, here we are coupling these two levels of the hierarchy. For each lecture, of course, there should be a diagram like this, because we want to stick to the BBJKY hierarchy we used in the very first lecture. So here we are using basic coupling Boltzmann and Newton, microscopic uh, description of uh, the polymer motion or biomolecule, which will be done through uh, molecular dynamics plus, of course, some other ingredients which I will discuss later on. And we couple the uh, dynamics of the molecules with the dynamics of the solvent, say, typically water for biological application, which is described by um, a meso or macroscopic uh, technique, where meso macro means that uh, we will be using a kinetic equation like the one we were discussing yesterday, although in a very peculiar way, because uh, this kinetic description, the way we will use it, is essentially equivalent to solving, in fact, the equation of fluid dynamics or continuum fluid dynamics. So we will use <coughs> a Boltzmann formalism to address a problem which, whose physical nature is basically hydrodynamics. And I will illustrate a little bit the reason why we do uh, uh, this uh, trick, quote unquote. So I call this meso and macro because formally it is a kinetic theory. So this is an in intermediate level between atomistic and continuum. But in fact, <coughs> from the physical point of view, what we want to describe is the dynamics of the solvent, and particularly the correlation between the molecular motion and the solvent. So this is the, the group of people who contributed uh, and still contributing to this type of research. And I think we started about two years ago. We call it DNA translocation. But <coughs> in the sequence, it will become apparent that DNA is the ultimate goal. But what we are doing so far is basically a generic polymer, as I will discuss later on. So essentially, our problem is try to understand how a biomolecule would uh, penetrate a membrane or a nanopore as a function of the various conditions, temperature, the length of the biomolecule, and so on and so forth. And especially, we want to take into account the effect of the surrounding environments, as I said, typically in a cell it would be water, um, on the uh, dynamics of this translocation process. Uh, translocation is very important not only in uh, biology, but also in high-tech uh, in, in application. For instance, as I understand, one of the uh, interesting applications would be that if you have an electric field here in this uh, section of the nanopore, uh, somehow there are means of reading the uh, electric signal generated by the DNA molecules so that you can read off the genetic content. At, at the speed which is orders of magnitude uh, higher than the technique based on, uh, on polymer crystallization. I think you could read off the entire genome in a matter of minutes, if I'm not wrong. And if you think of how long it took to decode the human genome with uh, crystallization techniques, you can have an idea of how, uh, how important this, uh, this technology can, can be in general. So translocation, just a little bit of context, is key to many phenomena like viral injection of DNA into host cells, the passage of proteins across cellular membrane, ultra-fast sequence of DNA. And um, of course, the two main avenues to, st to study this phenomenon is experiments, where you do in vitro study of the translocation. And theoretically, I mean, that would be a different talk. But 
Of course, people have been uh, using all the machinery of statistical mechanics and uh, computer simulation to address this problem. But it is not often the case that the solvent, which is the surrounding water, is properly taken into account. And we believe that with the, the, our multi-scale technique and our Boltzmann molecular dynamic approach, we have, in fact, an edge in this respect. Let me to see if I can. Yeah. Just again to give a few uh, numbers, uh, uh, as for, for matter of orientation, in biology, in particularly in, in this problem, it's very easily the, typically the case that you have to move, that you have to describe the dynamics of many billions of atoms over over a time span of milliseconds, seconds, or even minutes. And of course, in computing, you cannot afford that. If you do Typically, molecular dynamics is the, the computational uh, technique to, to study um, uh, molecular motion. I think the world record, if I'm not mistaken, is of the order of a bi few billion atoms over periods of 10 nanoseconds. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's the top you can have just for showcase application. Um, and of course, your, your legs, as usual, are very short. So you are off by several orders of magnitude, at least five orders of magnitude. So I would say that multi-scale modeling is, is uh, it's not only mandatory. I think biology is really a goldmine for multi-scale application. It's really probably the most uh, uh, fruitful field to which multi-scale uh, application should be addressed. Um, so what we do, just a, a little bit of uh, context, what we do, just to introduce the lattice Boltzmann, is to use, in fact, the lattice Boltzmann, um, which is a technique to solve the Boltzmann equation, is a particular method within a whole family of simulation strategies, which include a number of other important techniques. We might have heard about lattice gas cellular automata. These are perhaps too technical. But essentially, the idea is, uh, is the following. Instead of taking a continuum equation like Navier-Stokes and discretizing, take, you, could, you, may, you can see Navier-Stokes as a partial differential equation. Instead of discretizing, taking derivatives and putting them on a discrete speed, you do something different. You try to describe an underlying dynamics, which for the case of lattice gas cell automata would be even at the level of uh, atomic or, or molecules, although very special ones. And you try to invent, in fact, a fictitious set of molecules which are faithful enough to describe fluid dynamics at the, in the continuum limit when you take many of them. But at the same time, here you don't discretize any partial differential equation. You invent a fictitious dynamic for these molecules. Fictitious means that it has to be efficient when you run on a computer. Of course, I will not have time to go into full details of this, but still I think I can give the smell of it. The important thing, and that would be another series of lectures, that there are many computational and mathematical advantages in dealing with fluid using a kinetic point of view. But the important philosophical point is that uh, you start from statistical mechanics and eventually you back up your fictitious dynamics with numerical analysis because you have to do that. But the driver is not discretization of fluid equation. The driver is top, bottom up, is statistical physics. How does it work? Uh, no, I don't want to discuss it. Just to give a little bit the flavor of the method, essentially you are living in a crystal like this, and on each lattice side, which is indicated here, you remember yesterday I was talking about kinetic theory and molecules, okay? In a normal fluid, molecules would move anywhere in space, everywhere, so it's, uh, you have full rotational symmetry. In this game, in fact, you constrain the molecules to move just along the links of this lattice. You see there are six neighbors. Think of this uh, cubic cell. So if you have particles which are just moving to the face centers, and you have particles who are moving just to the edge centers. In this case, we have 18 plus there is a rest particle. So this is a 19. Uh, uh, the, the connection number is 19. And I think here you recognize what I wrote yesterday, although in discrete form. If I want the density of the fluid, rho xt, x is centered here at a given time t, all I have to do is just to count how many particles or the probability of having a particle along one of these directions i. So i is the index which is labeling the discrete speeds. Okay? So this is the analog of the integration. I don't have the blackboard today, but this is the analog. Not Chuck. Okay, 
Well, I see no chalk, but this is the this is the analog. No, maybe there is. It's here. Yeah. <coughs> this is the analog of what we wrote yesterday. So the density is the integral in, as a function of space and time. Is the integral for your sum over all possible velocity. Instead of having an integral, you have a sum. And that's the way you generate the density. And by the same rule, c sub i is the discrete velocity, one of these arrows. So it's either the blue or the, or the, or the pink ones. And so that means that you weight, in fact, your, uh, the, the moment of the, the molecular momentum, which is m times c sub i, with the probability of finding a particle along that direction. And this gives you the current density of the fluid. And by the same token, you generate pressure, temperature, and all the possible moments. Now, why would I do that instead of solving Navier-Stokes? I'll tell you in a moment. I hope I have a car. But essentially, the Navier-Stokes equation, the Boltzmann equation, discrete form looks like this. So basically, here you recognize the streaming operator, which means that if I have a particle uh, along a direction i at position x at time t, at time t plus 1, which 1 is the unit time step of the lattice Boltzmann, I have to find the particle in x plus c sub i, which is obvious because if I have a particle here at time t and the particle is moving rightwards at time t plus 1, I will find it here. And so you have to think in terms of a synchronous motion of all the particles. So the particles who are supposed to move left, next time step, are here. And those who move left, uh, right, sorry, oh, those who move left, they move this way. It's a synchronous motion. So each time you tick, all the particles synchronously move to the lattice uh, position, which are assigned to their velocity. So that's the streaming part. And that's the analog, of course, of the streaming operator, which we wrote yesterday, dt plus vdx f. If you integrate this between time t and time t plus 1, that's exactly what you get here. The right-hand side is, again, the Boltzmann collision operator, which we discussed yesterday. Here, I wrote it in a form which is essentially a relaxation form, although it is a matrix. In other words, the effect of the collisions on the part on population i is a mixed combination of the uh, deviation of the population j from its local equilibrium. The local equilibrium is just the Maxwellian we discussed yesterday. Okay? Plus, I have some external forces which are very important for, say, phase transitions and things like this. But we will not discuss them today. So why is that interesting to use uh, Lattice Boltzmann instead of uh, Navier-Stokes? <coughs> I think this we discussed in the first day. But uh, I think the major point as far as in, in, in terms of uh, uh, multiscale application is that, in a way, kinetic theory has this nice property that is dual. It is a field and a particle at the same time. Why do I say that? Because <coughs> it is a field because the distribution function is a smooth field. F sub i is the probability of finding a molecule moving along a certain direction. This probability is a field. It's a field between 0 and 1, but it changes smoothly in time. So here you have all the, if you want, the resolution power of continuum method. It is, these are not particles. These are probability. On the other hand, this information moves along very simple trajectories, because the trajectories are just straight lines. So you can cache on all the nice property of particle methods, which are not famous for being, use, uh, for, for being uh, easy to use for com in complex geometry, because it's easy to know where the particle is flying. This, I think I said that in the first day, is in stark contrast with the hydrodynamic representation of fluid motion. I think we touched on that in the very first lecture, where I have the operator that you have seen, the transport u grad u, means the fluid moving momentum along its own trajectory, which means that in the fluid dynamic representation, the information can travel on very wild trajectory. And that is a source of problems for the numerics. So here, the kinetic theory offers this great advantage that the nonlinearity is local and non-locality is linear, meaning by this that here you have grad is the non-local because you have to pick up information from the neighbor, and u u is the nonlinear non terms. In the Boltzmann representation, the two things are disentangled. Oops. So 
sorry, I'm going down, okay? Because the streaming does not depend on f, so the transport is linear. You move f along a trajectory which is independent of f, so the transport is linear. And the non-locality is hidden in the local equilibrium, which depends only on the fluid speed, and this is totally local. You don't need to communicate among different lattice sites. So that is a great advantage, for instance, for parallel computing application. That's really much more advantageous than u grad u. It gives you a lot of freedom on the boundary condition because, again, you, knowing that you move information along straight trajectories, it's, you can really ad arrange a very uh, complex boundary condition. These days, for instance, we are running hemodynamic simulation with arterial geometries. And it's very important to have a method where, in fact, you can track the, 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 the information and, when, and, and know exactly when, for instance, a particle is crossing a, a complex surface like an arterial geometry. This is too technical, uh, but I think, I think the, the important point is just to uh, realize that since you have, in fact, fields moving on particle trajectories, it's relatively, I would say, it's rather simple to couple Lattice Boltzmann to, Monte, to particle methods like Monte Carlo and molecular dynamics. And in this application, in fact, we will see a coupling to molecular dynamics. To do so, this is more of a, an historical point, but um, the lattice Boltzmann was basically designed, because of the reason I just told you, to compete with Navier-Stokes. Lattice Boltzmann is basically a Navier-Stokes solver. And if we want now to couple to polymers, we have somehow to go back and acknowledge that in the, mi in the microscopic, as a, that's again something I told you in the first lecture, in uh, the microscopic world, things move because of inertia. Once you start rolling, it's difficult to stop to stop a macroscopic body because inertia is, is uh, keeping the body in motion. In the nano world, things don't work this way. In the nano world, you know that many bacteria are just like cars moving in a hurricane. So you have to rely on different strategies and fluctuations are uh, extremely important. So what you have to do, you have to in enrich the Boltzmann description with some noise. Just to take into account that the molecules are, are moving in a very noisy environment. So that's what we did. The way we couple to molecular dynamics is the following. Suppose this is our polymer, okay? The laser is going, okay? So these are beads which represent the, in the case of DNA, these will be the base pairs. For, in our case, we call them bead, where bead means that it's a degree, uh, local degree of freedom. It's just a, a quantity which you can describe through the position. Here it's called particle. Sometimes they call them particles, sometimes they call them bit. But this is just the equation of motion of the particle P. Of course, the chemical nature of the polymer is totally hidden at this point. We would need one or two orders of magnitude resolu higher resolution to spell out the chemical specificity of the bit, which is something we hope we will be doing in a few years. Nowadays, it's still our computers are not powerful enough. But anyway. Uh, so these blue balls, we move with the standard Newtonian mechanics, so position goes with velocity, and in the velocity, though, there is a little bit of um, uh, sophistication. And the way we do is the following. So in the first place, this R stands for force over mass, and it is the, the, uh, in fact, the interaction between BP with BQ. So this is the... the potential, uh, uh, like Leonard Jones, there is a potential between the particles, and this pa each particle, in principle, uh, interacts with all the other bits in the chain. In practice, this is a rather short-range interaction, so each particle sees a, a lim very li limited number of neighbors. So this is molecular dynamics. Strictly speaking, molecular dynamics is this equation without any friction and without any randomness. So this is molecular dynamics, but as I said before, we have to take into account the noise and so that means that in this equation, you also have sometimes, not, not always, but sometimes you have to just shake a little bit the polymers just to take into account the fact that the solvent, which is not represented here, but think of this polymer moving in water, in a, say inside a cell, there would be the cytosol, and there are thermal fluctuations, right? So the bead would just... Uh, suffer some thermal agitation, and this is represented by this random uh, force here. Plus, of course, there is the usual drag. If this polymer is moving this way, along the blue arrow, 
the fluid will try to drag it back, and so I have a friction term, which I, some of you at least would certainly recognize. This is called, uh, this is the friction, is, a, is the frequency, in fact, is a damping term, and the effect of this damping term is that it wants to bring the, uh, the, the polymer, the bead velocity, Vp, which is this blue arrow, it wants to bring to the same value as the fluid velocity at the, at the bead position, which I represent here with the, with the arrow. So that's just ordinary friction, thermal agitation, and particle-particle interaction. We call this molecular dynamics, it should be called Langevin molecular dynamics, because Langevin is whenever you have some, is, this is stochastic uh, differential equation because we have noise. But people worked out uh, uh, powerful techniques to solve this, this, this kind of equation. Now, as to the coupling, the polymer, as you see, is living grid-free. The polymer means do not need to be sitting on a lattice. On the other hand, the red arrows here represent the fluid velocity, and the fluid velocity lives in the lattice. So this velocity comes from the lattice Boltzmann. So you have a system where, in fact, the molecular degrees of freedom are grid-free, whereas the fluid degrees of freedom are grid-frozen. So you immediately understand that in order to transfer information from one to another, we will need some interpolation and, and uh, standard interpolation extrapolation technique. This is a list of the interaction with molecular dynamics. I don't think we need to go through that. Uh, and another important point, which would be, I don't want to discuss in detail because it's too technical, but I think it's important to know that very often when you move these polymers, the difficult part, computationally speaking, is to impose the proper constraints to the molecules. In the case of DNA, uh, you should impose the constraint that the segment from bit to bit is, is a constant length, because these are kind of a, a rigid molecules. This is called persistent length, meaning by this that uh, this stretch of DNA it behaves like a rigid body. And so you have to impose a constraint like this, that the distance between uh, bit i and bit j can change orientation, but cannot uh, change in length. And this is a relatively uh, laborious task on the computer. <coughs> and there is a famous method, I think, uh, which this is uh, Simone F scientific father, Giovanni Cicotti. And this paper is a very <laughs> popular one. I think this paper is getting hundreds of citations per year because everybody is using this shake method. It's a technique to impose the uh, uh, rigidity, in fact, of the DNA. So in the early days, we were using this technique because this allows us to run much longer molecules than, than uh, otherwise possible. For the lattice both, I'm sorry, this is a PowerPoint. I think I, I wrote this equation in, in uh, Windows, and then and, and the apple is kind of uh, destroying the symbol. This should be tau. This we have seen yesterday is 1 over tau, and tau is the uh, collision, relaxation frequency. So all the physics of the fluctuation and the interaction with the polymer, I, I really don't want to go into any details, goes into an external term which is like a force experienced by the uh, lattice Boltzmann population. This can be pretty technical. Uh, so you have to be very careful when you construct this term, but uh, we have an handle on it. And, uh, and, the numer and as you see, the Boltzmann equation becomes itself a stochastic equation because eventually this tilde here means that I have uh, noise into this uh, um, force as well as a result of the thermal agitation. So this equation is not that easy to be solved. And I think the time step where we are using could be, uh, could be improved. Uh, just to say that the fluctuating lattice Boltzmann or, or Langevin lattice Boltzmann is, computationally speaking, significantly more laborious than the standard Boltzmann equation, lattice Boltzmann equation for fluids. Now, this is a diagram that by now you recognize very well. It's again a specific instance of the multi-scale strategies we have been discussing during these lectures. And as you see, this is multi-scale and multi-physics at the time because we have two parallel timelines for the molecular degrees of freedom and for the Boltzmann degrees of freedom. So here we evolve things concurrently. Okay? It's a bit like what we did yesterday except that now the, uh, the molecular dynamic system is integrated all over. We never stop 
You remember what I said yesterday with the shock. At some point, you can forget about the shock, maybe. <clears throat> you, move, you put the shock in your bag, and you hide it. You move large steps with the microscopic solvent, and eventually open the bag when needed. Here, the bag is always open. The molecular degrees of freedom, we, maybe Simone can comment on that, but we see no reason why we, we may or, or could stop integrating the molecular dynamics at any time. We all ne always need the uh, specific description of the molecular degrees of freedom. So what we do is the following. It's rather simple, I would say. Grid to particle interpolation of velocity, which means that here we have the fluid velocity, the white dots, and we have to bring the velocity into the particle location. Remember the equation. We have u living on the grid, and we have to bring this u just on top of the particle location. So we have to interpolate from the grid cell to the uh, particle position. Okay? It's an interpolation, nothing fancy, but you have to do it. Then, for a number of time steps, which is uh, indicated here, we advance the molecular state. So tac, 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 tac. Typically, we use 5 to 10, but that's a matter of, uh, that's an option. And so this is the grid to particle. Okay, Boltzmann lives on the grid. You move the information to the particle. You advance the particle. And at some point, you want to give some information back from the particle to the grid, which is particle to grid. We call it extrapolation. I'm not sure extrapolation is the right word. I think the technical term is that here we gather information and here we scatter the information, which means that here we have uh, the, um, the velocity of the polymer here, and you have to bring it back to the grid. So a typical recipe would be I give one-fourth to my neighbor, but there are more sophisticated uh, recipes than this. In any, in any case, it's just you break the uh, contribution of this particle into four pieces, and you give a fraction of the particle content, in fact, of its velocity, to each of these four neighbors. And why you do so? Well, because what you need is, uh, in fact, uh, in the Boltzmann equation, actually, you need the, the term gamma v minus u. I'm sorry, just I, I think I wrote it. No. Uh, well, actually, it's not written. But it, in fact, you term the you, you need the counter term. The term corresponds to gamma v minus u into this part of the equation. It's the action reaction. If the fluid is dragging the polymer, the polymer is acting on the fluid. So in this force, I have some gamma v minus u term, which has to be brought into the, into the grid position. Okay? And once you have brought it back, then you can keep uh, moving uh, in time with, uh, with larger steps. Is that clear? Today I have less question because maybe the, the matter is a, little, is a little bit more uh, technical. Is that clear what we are doing? Any any source of uncertainty? No. OK. So the interesting thing, well, interesting, is that in um, this coupling, I mean, the, the ratio, the time step of the molecular dynamics versus the lattice Boltzmann is relative, is rather tight. I think we don't, it's about 5 to 10. Uh, whereas if you use a typical application using, in, in fact, the Navier-Stokes equation instead of lattice Boltzmann as a macroscopic solvent, the zero ratio is much higher. It's about 100. Because, in a way, La Boltzmann kinetic theory is closer to molecular dynamics than continuum theory. So you can keep them a little bit more tightly coupled. And that has an impact on, on, on the performances, of course, because uh, you, de you do, in fact, many less molecular dynamic steps per lattice Boltzmann step which is an advantage from the computational point of view. Uh, yeah. So that means that in the lattice Boltzmann model, you do adjust the Kingston number to have the right Kingston number each time? We really never thought about the Knudsen number. I don't think the Knudsen number. The Knudsen number is the mean free path to the typical macroscopic scale. Yeah? Right, in a liquid, the Knudsen number is usually safe is uh, why do you think it oh, I thought that you might have uh, um, that you might have a high things in number application because it's a gamma fluid yeah uh, 
I think you all by now are familiar. The Knudsen number, as we said many times, is the ratio of the smallest hydrodynamic scale to the particle mean free path. In a liquid, the mean free path is pretty small. In water, the mean free path is smaller than the interaction range. It's a fraction of nanometer. And here we will see we are moving the polymers through holes which are, uh, say, a few nanometers in size. I don't know. Maybe you're right. I don't think this is an immediate concern, but it could be. Because we are moving in a macroscopic, the macroscopic domain is itself nanoscopic. But uh, Jonas, in, in water, in fact, the mean free path, as, as I showed you yesterday, is, is that's, a, that's good that you asked this question, because it's really very different. Yesterday, you remember what I told you. I have molecules. They move in a free path, and every now and then they interact, right? And the mean free path is the distance between two subsequent uh, collisions. This picture is totally wrong as applied to a liquid, because in a liquid, the molecules have a finite size and they are constantly interacting. So the mean free path of the molecule in a liquid is less than the uh, interaction range. So it's a fraction of nanometer. And since we are moving, as we will see soon, our, we are moving the polymers through holes. But these holes are typically, if I'm not mistaken, for a few nanometers. I would say the Knudsen number is at least less than 0.1. So it should not be a concern, but maybe. Okay? But the thing I want to uh, bring uh, to your attention is, would you agree that this is really simple after all? I mean, we don't need to bother about grid refinement, at least not in the first place. And the boundary conditions themselves are relatively simple, because um, we don't have matching condition. All we have to do is just to transfer the proper forces and velocity from the grid to particles. So I might be wrong, but that's if there is any native English speaker here, they, I would be grateful to be taught what seamless means. Bruce, you should you are supposed to be a native. To me, seamless means that there are no angles. I mean, it's it's a smooth thing. Is that correct? But one referee told us there is nothing seamless about this procedure. So I would be grateful to be told what seamless means in proper English. Ah, so no stitches. Stitches, where they, they sew two pieces of cloth. So seamless means no stitches. Seamless means you can't see. OK, so I would say that this is seamless. Well, would you agree with that? <laughs> you don't know. It's simple. I mean, all I have to do is interpolation, extrapolation. I don't need to bother about overlapping domains, making sure that the derivatives are the same, the kind of troubles you always have in multi-grid. So that's the way I use the word seamless. But since I'm no native speaker, I see that you don't agree either. So no, I, sh I, I should remove it. Maybe it's less seamless than other methods, but still. No, seamless means seamless with more seamless. Uh, please, please don't confuse me. For and what is the seam? What is the seam? I'm just interpolating, extrapolating. And I, we were very proud of this, that we do multi-scale with just interpolation and extrapolation. Nothing else. I mean, no flux boundary condition, no derivatives, nothing. So I would like, uh, in my opinion, this is a very nice way of doing multi-scale. But maybe I'm oversimplifying the picture. As compared to what I showed you yesterday, and yesterday was slightly more than an exercise. It was not a true application. This seems to me much simpler. Of course, there are subtleties, but I mean the structure, the multi-scale structure is plain. That's what I meant by seamless. But anyway. Uh, yesterday, the idea was that you do a local grid refinement whenever you need it. So you open the, the grid window and you close it in different places. Right. So that's more involved. That's more involved. Here you keep the full information yeah. as available from you. Yeah, we pay a price, Simone, because we integrate molecular dynamics yeah, yeah. all over. So you never lose information here. You do just a little bit of information to give the two levels 
That's what I think Jonas and other people commented yesterday. So you cannot just put the shock in the bag, move along, and reopen, because that would uh, pollute your macroscopic solution. This was your objection again, or some other people. Somebody else. Uh, so in this case, we are not exposed to this objection, because we carry on molecular dynamics all over. I don't think we could stop. Maybe, yeah. Pardon? What sets the time scale as uh, a time step for? Oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big headache. Uh, but in the first place, the answer is that there is no unique recipe. The mapping of this damned application into the real world is not unique. Because with the polymers and the fluid, especially the polymers, there are many parameters around. And in the end, Simone convinced us, is the expert in molecular dynamics that the um, important, um, the way you, you should set your, the, the spacing of the lattice Boltzmann based on the persistent length of the polymer. That's the basic choice you make. So <clears throat> I had a picture before when I showed the persistent length, which is the distance between the two beads. And basically this, we want to have the delta x of the order of magnitude of this. That fixes the space. Uh, the, the, the spacing of the, of the solution, and then to get the time step, then you have to investigate what the uh, t typical speed of the phenomena which are involved. Uh, you have many velocities. You have the sound speed. You have the, the translocation speed. And you want to make sure that the fastest, the, this distance slash the fastest speed is still resolved by your delta t. I, I will come to that. I mean, but. It's, there is no, no immediate answer to your question. Yeah, sure. Why are there not Because uh, you have two requirements for your time. First, that you don't have the cold atom blow up. So it has stability issues. And second, that the time step is not too large. That means you don't get some systematic bias. Uh, usually, I mean, if you look at deterministic molecular dynamics, the two things basically coincide. So if your system doesn't blow up, means that you have stability and uh, no bias. Here it's a bit different because it's stochastic. Mm. Uh, so you we could get some, say, spurious temperature uh, differences due to the time step. So you, you have to keep this under control. But the, the picture is not that different. So yeah, stability also, is I mean, governing I, your I time think step. this constraint Well, for this, I think the technique which I was describing is, is taking care of that. Actually, since you are uh, doing rich bonds, you are cutting off all the high frequency motion. Yeah. Because of this trick. And Instead of using springs. Instead yes, of using yeah. Springs. Well, now I will tell you the Now we use springs for the parallel computer, but on a serial computer, we prefer to have that, just to get rid of the fast frequencies. I'll come to that in the last part. Now, uh, I'm not sure this is, perhaps this is too technical, but again, just to convey you the feeling. Uh, why is Lattice Boltzmann interesting uh, rather than uh, interesting, I mean, for this type of application? Well, uh, one of the assets is the following. A, a typical workhorse for this type of studies, which is polymers into solvents, is Brownian dynamics. Okay. In Brownian dynamics, you move the particles like this, dv, dt, with long-range forces because it's just a little bit like electrostatics, which means that if I'm a bead here and I interact with the bead there through the um, uh, field, which is almost like the electrostatic field, it's a long-range interaction which, carrying, which is carrying the hydrodynamic correlation. So this d, I don't remember why I call it d, but it's called Ozin tensor, and this tensor is global. Okay? which means that at least in naive uh, uh, implementation, the way hydrodynamics is correlation are, are taken into account mm -hmm. is pretty expensive because each bead has to uh, interact with all other beads. And this gives you a, an algorithm which is scaling at best, like n squared, where n is the number of beads. So this is severe limitation on the, on the length of the polymer. In the lattice Boltzmann, things go differently. And I have to track it back quite a bit. 
and C mu, and I think that. In lattice Boltzmann, it's different because <coughs> so these vortices are essentially what uh, I mean by hydrodynamic correlation. By the very fact that this bead is moving over here, it will generate a structure in the surrounding fluid, and if I have another bead here, it will fill that structure. So this is what I mean by long-range interaction, and this long-range is carried over by the vortices. When you do the simulation, you don't see such a clean vortex. vortex you have to do averaging because there is a lot of noise, but this coherent structure is there, and I can promise it affects a lot the motion of the particle. Now, in general, what people do, I mean, the Brownian dynamics is based on the idea that this is a charge, and it generates a long-range electric field, and if I have another charge here, there will be an interaction uh, with all other charges. In lattice Boltzmann, we do it differently, because this, uh, this particle, in fact, will interact only with the fluid population around it. You remember the box I was, uh, I can remember the box. All the interactions are local, so we never do long range. Uh, remember, we have the lattice Boltzmann is living here, okay, and the polymer is going through. This polymer bit will only interact with the lattice location in that cell. And it will be for this Boltzmann population to interact with other population due to the streaming. And it will be the Boltzmann equation which will carry this interaction over and over and over until I find another particle. And it will still locally interact with the other part. So there are, the notion of action at distance is totally disappeared. And that means that your algorithm scales linearly with the number of bits. That's why I was saying, the, I'm sorry, I don't know whether you can see that. I should have highlighted this. This is a big difference. So the algorithm is local. There is no long range interaction. So the complexity of the algorithm just is proportional to the number of bits. That allows you to make much longer polymers. In fact, up to a few years ago at least, uh, Brownian Dynamics doing a four, two, 300 uh, bits was already kind of state of the art. And with this algorithm, two, 300 bits is just a piece of cake. Now, these days, on the, on the blue gene, first year in Harvard and then in your town, we are running, I think, how much? 16,000, I guess, oh, bits. Our poly, our current parents are of the order of 16,000. Uh, but, but there are uh, 16 different stacks. Anyway, just to tell you that this is a major part. Of course, there is no free lunch, and the price to pay for that is that our time step has to be small. So even the lattice Boltzmann step, this one, which here I present as large as compared to molecular dynamics, as compared to an hydrodynamic solver would probably be smaller, just because I have to track the uh, information in time as I said, once again, this is the interaction of this bead with the fluid. Then the fluid, there are other fluid cells, and will carry memory of this interaction all over the grid. And this has to go into time steps. And these time steps have to be well resolved. So the price to pay for linear scaling with the number of bits is that the time step will be small. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a good bargain. The reason is, um, well, I, I didn't say that it is necessarily so, but uh, the reason is that you have, when you have long-range interaction, okay, when you have a long-range interaction, you say that this acts instantly on this particle is just like having an infinite uh, propagation speed, right? Action at distance, OK? And this is convenient because you don't have any time evolution to track. But so in principle, instead of solving a time evolved, this is an extreme case. Instead of solving an, an, a time-dependent problem, you solve it in a single uh, step because you have no time derivative. But this brings in the fact that the complexity is square because each particle is any other particle. If I want to carry, here I'm generating some vorticity. The vorticity has to be taken to the other particle, and I have to track this evolution in detail. 
And this is generally a costly process, process because this is the fastest speed in the game. This is typically the sound speed. So lattice Boltzmann is, has this very nice property that is linear, but as a price to pay for this linearity is that you have to track the fastest process into the game, which is the propagation of sound waves. Vorticity basically moves more or less to the, at the velocity of sound waves. I don't know. I don't know. For probably for, in, for a compressible Navier-Stokes solver, you would have a similar. But certainly, I mean, in Brownian dynamics, which is the workhorse of this, uh, business, of this uh, type of application, you don't even have the time stepping because it's just solving electrostatic, okay? Infinite speed. The price for infinite speed is uh, no locality. That's the general rule. No locality means n squared. So I think on, a, on any computer, but. No, That's also a point. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think it is too. I never really yeah, thought. I mean, Here we are talking water, Kim. Sort of delta x squared over delta t type mm -hmm. uh, numerical viscosity. In a lattice Boltzmann solver, you can make the viscosity a tiny fraction of that. Okay. Yeah. Even a hundredth, isn't it, in some applications now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, although, Tim, I'm not sure. I think these arguments carry so because here we are talking <coughs> nanoflows, and, and so the solvent is water. The solvent is what? The solvent is water, and we are talking nanoflows. Oh, okay. So we are in, if you want, the other extreme as compared to, to the hydrodynamics. I'm, it might still be true, but I'm not, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. Um, but true is that the mean free path is a fraction of the delta x. This is certainly true. Still true. OK, so, uh, but coming back to the point, this is a general rule. If you uh, give up the time evolution of your system, sometimes, at least in the old days, people thought that, OK, I'm solving a steady problem, so uh, I don't bother with the time evolution, and I gain. Careful. You don't, you're not so sure that you gain because then you end up with the n square problem, and very often you have matrices to invert, which can be a real pain in the neck. I think, given, uh, I think, uh, parallel computer certainly give uh, an incentive to pursue this kind of explicit strategies. Remember lecture number two. I make, I made the clear distinction. Clear. I mean, <clears throat> general distinction between explicit and implicit method. That's exactly what we are talking about here. Yeah. Right. No, no, no. No, no. I promise. This, everything here is n. Lattice Boltzmann is definitely n because everything is local. I mean, you never have anything but this type of interaction. I mean, I, of course, I'm presenting the nice part of the cake because when you have to deal properly with this interaction, there are many details that you have to fix. But this doesn't change the fact that really everything is local. And since everything is local, the work you, may, you do is really proportional to the number of degrees of freedom you have into the game. This is certainly true. You have to do a proper work. I, mean, it's, I now I'm saying, oh, it's just extrapolation, extrapolation. It is like that, but then you have to be careful. You know, fluctuation dissipation theorem for those of you are, who know about that. I mean, you have to enforce a number of symmetries, and this is not completely trivial, but locality is for guaranteed. So you may argue, so what? I have very nice matrix solvers. I'd rather do my Stokes uh, Brownian dynamics. But as I'm saying, uh, by the way, I should give credit. The, the first person who did these things is uh, Tony Ladd, about ten, more than 10 years ago by now. And from the scratch, he could run polymers which were almost 10 times larger than Brown, Brownian dynamics. And as I say, nowadays on the blue gene, we're really running long polymers. That would be in the art part, large, uh, final part of my talk. So we are really uh, strongly insisting on locality. And I think that's a good choice if you have a parallel computer in mind. So 
yeah, so that's a general characteristic I, I was wanted to point out. And now we, we take a brief excursus. That's from not really the hardcore of my lecture. This would be really the, the seminar. But of course, um, ju just to give you a little bit the, the idea of the results that you get. So <clears throat> since we are moving, in fact, one-dimensional object through uh, a fluid and, and through nanopores, of course, you can uh, imagine that there are all sorts of um, statistical mechanics, uh, Cardari here at MIT, Lubensky Nelson here in Harvard. They have a um, very nice um, theoretical model based on just statistical uh, theory uh, to predict, for instance, how long would it take to the polymer to go through the hole as a function of its length. And when you want to get more detail, not just scaling laws, then you have to do simulation. And typically, the, the full body, full atomistic simulation, molecular dynamics of Monte Carlo, typically Monte Carlo. But of course, it's impossible to track the time histories for, uh, I think, a translocation events can last uh, milliseconds. And you don't do a milliseconds with, with molecular dynamics. With the hydrodynamics included, the, as I said, the most important thing, most uh, used uh, use technique is Brownian dynamics. Uh, I think Lattice Boltzmann is really here to stay in the, in the field, although there are many refinements needed. But uh, as I said before, Brownian dynamics is expensive, and Lattice Boltzmann has a number of things that need to be fixed. But at least you can be guaranteed that your algorithm is uh, ON, and that's a big answer. Oh, OK. Yeah. As you like. I mean, I, I was late, so probably it's better to have a break. We always add, unless you have strong objection, I would take a break and, and, and go over to the second part of the talk. Or you want to, do you prefer to continue? Break sounds good. Break sounds good. That's great. So I think we start again. You can keep enjoying your coffee. Um, so what do we do? Uh, what is this? Yeah. <clears throat> Essentially, what we are trying to predict is this, I guess, is a nanopore. And there is, in fact, an electric field which is localized and driving the uh, polymer from one side to another. And I don't know whether you can see this, but this is an electric signal, OK, which is because there is an um, ionic solution into this device. And when the polymer is in the pore, it would basically uh, shield the electric charge of the ionic solution. And so there will be a current drop. And the dwell time, which is indicated here, the, 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 the time lapse between the initial and final part of the drop, which is called dwell time, tells you, in fact, how long did it take for the polymer to go through. So people do experiments to uh, understand how long does it take as a function of the various quantities around, and primarily the, uh, as a function of the polymer length. So there are plenty of statistical measures. And so what we are trying to do, and one uh, typical result is the dwell time, so how long does it take to go through, as a function of the DNA length. Here, I doubt you can read, but the DNA length for this experiment, these are artificial synthetic nanopores. Uh, diameter is about two, 2 to 4 nanometers, if I'm not mistaken. And the DNA length is relatively uh, small. So this is 10 to 100 kilo base pairs, so uh, at most uh, 100,000 base pairs. So this is relatively short DNA. And uh, so what you're trying to figure out, how does the dwell time scale in, in, as a function of the polymer length? So to answer this, this is the first uh, the zeroth order question. Then there are many more detailed features. Uh, but anyway, just to show you a cartoon of what we do, uh, but by now, we have all the elements. So this is a polymer string. So the green one are those who have already translocated. The idea you have the localized electric field, which can be thought of as kind of molecular motor. And these triangles uh, is just a cartoon for the uh, solvent, for the water degrees of freedom. Uh, as Kim was pointing out uh, just now during the discussion, I should make an important amendment. Uh, of course, we have a number of interesting properties for our solvent, but I wouldn't go uh, too far in, in claiming that what we have is real water. So I, please don't be fooled. Uh, we don't have the equation of state of water. There are uh, the compressibility issues, etc. But we believe that what we have is enough to give at least a reasonable description of the statistical pro and dynamical properties of the translocation process. 
I think one very nice uh, development of this project would be to, in fact, make our lattice Boltzmann more compliant with the true liquid, which is non-trivial. Uh, so since Kim was asking, well, what did you do to get the real liquid? Well, we didn't do, we didn't do much except by uh, in injecting fluctuations, I was ashamed. But this is another issue. So our solvent is, is uh, as some of the properties which are needed to describe the interaction with the polymer, but, but we, couldn't, we cannot say, strictly speaking, that this is what. There is work, a lot of work, to, to, to make it quantitatively like what. But nonetheless, I think we have a fairly interesting description of these interactions, so polymer versus solid. So this is the cartoon of our experiment. And numbers, again, these numbers, there is not that they would come from a unique, uh, um, there is no unique way of mapping. So after a number of mumbling, uh, mumbles, how do you say, after thinking and pondering, uh, basically these are the figures. So one lattice Boltzmann uh, population, in fact, the degree of freedom in the computer would basically map uh, into 10 to 5, 10 to 6 uh, real water molecules. And one of our bits is essentially a gauge around the, the DNA persistent length, which means that we have about, uh, contains about 100 base pairs. So you see it's a rather coarse grain model. Certainly we cannot have physical speci uh, chemical specificity here. The LBM decoupling is described here, so we have basically separation of 5 to 10, and basically the, the, the lattice Boltzmann spacing is of the order of uh, the effective molecular dynamic interaction, and this is larger than the, the real one. So in, effect, in fact, here we are upscaling molecular dynamics significantly. This sigma here is in, in the true um, um, liquid would be, I think, of the order less than a, in a, in a nanometer, whereas here we make it at least 10 times higher. So of course, we are downstretching lattice Boltzmann and upstretching molecular dynamics, and so you have to be careful in evaluating, in fact, the quality of your results. Uh, okay, just two words about the regime. The regime we are interested in is when this translocation is so-called fast, because when the trans translocation fast means that the polymer goes through without having time to relax to its uh, native configuration. And in the fast translocation regime, it's very hard to give an analytical description or statistical description of the process because the, the, the translocation is uh, always in non, non out of equilibrium. Okay? So it's intrinsically dynamic, and there are criteria for that. Basically, the criteria is that the pulling force, which is the electric field, times the typical gyration radius of the polymer, so this is potential energy which you inject through the electric field, be at least 50 times larger than the typical thermal energy. That's a criteria. You can work it out almost on the back of the envelope. But the important thing to be uh, re uh, retained is that if the translocation, if this number is in this order of magnitude, the polymer just doesn't have time to relax before it translocates. And so the process is intrinsically non-equilibrium, and that's why you need uh, simulation. Nonetheless, uh, if your only question is about the scaling regime, which is to say, uh, how does the polymer translocation time change with the number of bits, which is with the polymer length? Typically, what the experiment uh, provides you is a scaling law of this kind, where alpha, this exponent, is of the order slightly over 1. It's typically 1.27. Uh, please appreciate that alpha equal 1 would be uh, the ideal situation in which the polymer don't, the, sorry, the monomer don't see each other. In other words, if the times would scale just linearly, exponent one with the number of bits, it means that each bit is taking, is translocating independently of all others. As soon as this, the bit, uh, in fact, as soon as this exponent gets larger than one, it means that it takes longer than that. So that means that the effect of one bit on the other bit is just to slow it down. And that's what observed here. The typical exponent is 1.27, meaning that the fact that you have many monomers makes the translocation of each single monomer slower than it would be uh, uh, if this monomer would translocate free. But it's, uh, I mean, it's not a factor. Uh, this exponent is still relatively close to 1. So this slowdown effect is not that terrible. So uh, the first thing you do when you run this uh, application, you try to reproduce uh, the data. 
And here, the, our question was, uh, since we claim, and I think we are on a solid ground, that we have a nice treatment of the hydrodynamic correlation, we wanted to see whether what is the contribution of hydrodynamic correlation, which is to say, suppose now we make the experiment, we take water out of the experiment, and we run without hydrodynamics, what is the difference as compared to the case with hydrodynamics? And the difference is uh, very significant. And this, at least to me, coming from macroscopic fluid dynamics, this was amazing because when you look at the simulation, there is no free, no, no net motion. I mean, the, the, the solvent is standing still. And yet, I mean, it, you remember these little vortices of world speech? They really make a difference. So the exponent, which this is an old result, but I think now we get 1.47. This is without hydrodynamics. And with hydrodynamics, uh, we got in the, these I think are some of our earlier simulation, 1.27. So it really makes a big difference. Take, for instance, here we have a number of bits, it's 200, 300, say, of the order of 500, or take 300, I guess. Here we get uh, something like less than 20,000, and here we get something like 80,000. So that makes the translocation four times slower. So even though the change in the exponent doesn't look to be that big, but since it is an exponent, when you make the polymer long, the difference is very small. What's the reason for that? Well, uh, the reason is not clear, but uh, in the end... One other question here is the theoretical basis of 1.5 For the 1.5, I think uh, there is no theoretical basis. Um, the, in fact, the 1.27, let, let me describe the, the hydrodynamic first. There is a model according to which the polymer would translocate like, in, like if it was a kind of solid body, like a blob. Okay? And then you compute the hydrodynamic drag on this blob, and you balance the hydrodynamic uh, drag uh, with uh, some... Uh, you balance, in fact, the electric field with hydrodynamic drag. And based on simple scaling laws of the gyration radius of the polymer with its length, you get an exponent 127, if I'm not wrong. Uh, without hydrodynamics, frankly, and I don't remember. Are there any theory? Well, you have the a label theoretical. That's what I'm trying to understand. The 1.63 is what we have down there. Is the comparison of the hydrodynamic drag with the electric field dimensional set of weight and Ah, that's right. And yes. then there's also one work, uh, theoretical work with Krauss dynamics. That gives a 1.36, which is our uh, new uh, latest result. We have something like 1.30 something yeah, uh, without hydrodynamics. Exactly. So there are many different theories different around. Many theories but around. but in, yeah. so in general, the theories are either without hydrodynamics, and then they rely on, uh, yeah, on this uh, self -avoid, generalization of self-avoiding work kind of uh, reasoning. And the hydrodynamic, uh, the only hydrodynamic one we know of uh, is this blob picture, which is really very simple from the hydrodynamic point of view. And yet it seems to capture pretty, rather well the exponent, even though this is our re most recent and still unpublished work. I think it's almost, uh, uh, they, they catch it just because of a series of very lucky uh, circumstances. In other words, it is not true that the translocation takes place in a blob form. And when we do the numerics, I don't think I have the picture here, but it's, it's clear that they got the right exponent, but the physics behind it was not really uh, well captured by this block picture. This is just, this I think is the very first picture we draw, and the idea, yes, is that here you see the blob, it would be the right one. But when you do the simulation, you get something else. So I think I would skip that, and let me, let me show... Why don't I show you directly? We will eventually come back to this later. So that's a typical, uh, a typical picture of what we do. So here you see this is the chain, and it's, it's getting through the hole. And one nice thing you can do with the simulation, uh, I think uh, Maria has better picture than this, but anyway, we are trying to plot, in fact, the so-called synergy. The synergy is, in fact, the amount of work that the fluid is putting on the polymer. So you take the fluid speed, scalar product with the molecular speed, which gives an idea of how much work you are uh, putting into the polymer, and we plot the isocontour of this uh, synergy. And it is interesting to notice that this synergy is basically frozen in into the material polymer. In other words, you define a sort of effective polymer, which is the material po polymer surrounded by its synergy, which is the amount of cooperation that it gets from the solvent. 
And this uh, synergy is basically a sort of lubricant because due to the fact that when the synergy is high, the fluid is helping the polymer to go through, uh, in fact, it is an effective lubricant. So it is like having a larger pore size. And this explains why, in fact, the hydrodynamics is helping. It's, it's a bit fuzzy, but uh, the point is that if the polymer f moves, the, the fluid, in fact, is um, gener by generating these roles, the fluid is it's just like, I think, the, the notion, uh, I think Aristotle was the first one who explained the motion of the arrow. The arrow moves because it generates the vortex, and the vortex is just pushing back. I think, I think it really dates back to Aristotle and the long time tail, Halder, and for those of you who know, is based on this. So when you have a solid object which is moving, if I generate a vortex, very often this, this vortex is helping the motion itself. And in our case, we believe that this synergy is just another, yet another phase of this Arist Aristotelian mechanism. And the effect is, I would say, rather uh, spectacular. Well, spectacular maybe not, but I mean, it's sensible. To me, as I say, when you look at the, the fluid in itself, uh, I don't have the movies here, but the, essentially shaking like that, and the pen you say is sitting there for nothing. No, no, I mean, when, when you look at the motion of the molecule, you see that there is a difference. And then, of course, you, you find a lot of amazing things. So these are the, our oldest movies, but there is a lot, lot of, oh, what's going on here? Well, I don't remember. This is the case yeah, with hydrodynamics and without hydrodynamics. And if this is a typical trajectory. So this is the number of beads which have translocated as a function of time. So with hydrodynamics, you translocate here, in this case, after 20,000 steps. And without, it takes forever. See, it takes a long time. Because here, the, the polymer doesn't get any help from the fluid. So just to say that when you track individual trajectories, and you have to track many of them, you have to do a lot of statistical sampling, you see really a zoo of different behaviors. Is the point of this to try to segregate the DNA according to length or something? Or is there some practical application in it? The practical application, I was saying in the beginning, at least the way we, we saw it, the motivation was in technology to see if you can read off the elect when the polymer goes through, it screens off the electric signal. And so that you could read the base pair content. And if you could do that in an experiment, you would uh, decode the DNA human the genome in, in minutes. So that would be a technological application. But in general, people are interested in knowing how, uh, say, proteins or long molecules go through membranes and things like this. I'm not an expert. But from the simulation point of view, all I'm saying is that this type of simulation really take a lot of uh, ensemble average. I mean, if you track individual uh, trajectories, there they can be really a widely, quite different behavior of individuals. So fast versus slow translocation, I don't remember. Ah, so this is just to say that even when you have hydrodynamic scene, you can still have configuration which go through fast, and the other which take, you know, typically when you take such an air pin configuration, air pin are almost blocking the translocation. So it takes a long time, you know, to recover. And even though here the electric field is pulling, pushing, in fact, in the, in the direction. So this is the case. Both cases are with hydrodynamics. And you see the, the, the statistical scatter of it. This is, was a lucky trajectory. Went through basically no problem. And here, there was clearly a situation of coast, almost coasting before it could uh, recover. So just to say that this simulation, you don't perform just one. You have to perform statistical ensemble. And some cases are really amazing. Look at this one. This is a function of the temperature. So this is, looks like it's going through. Then it goes into an air pin and tack, retracted. <laughs> and this thing happened in the experiment. And then I think here what we were doing, we were just raising the temp. These are very old. I think there are very few at first. And um, since there is a little more of thermal agitation, this air pin configuration is uh, escaped. And, and then it goes through. So just to say that you, it's amazing. And at those times, we concluded that if the polymer enter a corner of phase space uh, where uh, air pin can live, the air pin have a, a big entropic barrier to cross. And if you end up in such a configuration, it's very hard to push it through. And sometimes you can even retract. So there is a lot of uh, richness into this simulation. More recently, I've been dealing with 
in fact, multified translocation. If you open up a larger hole here, you don't see, but the hole is uh, larger than in the previous simulation. It may happen that the polymer goes through not just with a single strand, but here there are two strands. And that's, again, something the experimentalist um, would like to understand. And it looks like, um, uh, in fact, they would like to understand whether by going through in this way, whether the scaling laws are still uh, apply, and et cetera, et cetera. It's totally open. I think this field is just beginning. And I don't really want to say much about this. I want to just go, how much time do we have? Uh, well, OK, maybe I have some time. And for instance, here, if I remember correctly, yeah, uh, when you do the simulation, you indeed realize that there is a sort of, this is so-called quantized blockade. Now, it means that when you, um, what we do here is the number of polymers, monomers, which are resident in the nanoflow, uh, and this is a statistics. You take many translocations, and for each translocation, you count how many monomers are, uh, in the average, are sitting in the, in, inside the channel. And you find that most of the time, you either, fi either find one strand or two strands. So it's kind of quantized. It's very uh, seldom the case where you would find uh, a mixture of the two. So the question is whether this uh, distribution, in fact, is uh, sharp or, or whether you have a sort of continuum spectrum. In general, uh, what people find in the experiment is that uh, the, either the translocation is with one strand, two strands, or three strands is, are integer numbers, which is uh, kind of fascinating. But anyway, that would be too detailed. I want to go to another subject, just to conclude. And how do we move, in fact, towards? Sure. How do you choose the number of this here for one B? Oh, just based on resolution, as I said. Uh, typical uh, structure unit for um, sorry uh, it, it means it's a structure unit typical structure unit for DNA structure no no we don't have the DNA structure I mean what the, the resolution means that we know that we can run for instance on a given grid mm. say 10,000 monomers mm -hmm. then knowing that your grid size is a certain number of nanometers typically mm -hmm. comparable to the persistent length, which is about 50 nanometers, mm -hmm. then you know that if, if uh, one bit is of the order of, say, a fraction of 10 or 50 mm -hmm. nanometers, mm -hmm. uh, you cannot uh, represent the, the, the base pair in the chemical specificity. Mm -hmm. So that's basically, so it's, it's an anonymous polymer in that respect. Uh, we should scale up this by, I think, at least two orders of magnitude before we can represent the base pair as, a, as a, mm -hmm. an ensemble of molecules. Oh, thank you. So that's still a long way. But, um, but of course, this will be the ultimate goal. So uh, to this purpose, we have began, I think, for less than a year. Uh, Simone and, and my colleague Massimo in Rome, they have developed a parallel version of the code to be run on the blue gene here in, in Harvard. And uh, in uh, the earliest simulation, OK, uh, in the first place, developing the parallel code is, is take some ingenuity and, and some expertise because molecular dynamics and lattice boltons in that respect don't combine easily. In the lattice boltons, suppose you have a situation like this, you have nine proce processors, and it's very easy to say, uh, okay, uh, I give all the sites which belong to this processor, and the only communication you need is when there is some uh, lattice site which is, say, moving a particle north and it will fry from this processor to this uh, different processor. But since the lattice structure is static, once you assign the uh, nodes to a given processor, this is given uh, once and for all. But the molecules are moving all the time, so they change ownership, and this implies a lot of communication. So it is not trivial to combine the two. But they did an excellent job, and now I will show you the, perma the, 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 the performance. So in the first uh, typical simulation that you can run on this machine is of the order of uh, 1 billion sites, perhaps a little bit less, but of the order of 1,000 cube, which is a sizable uh, fluid dynamic calculation. And the polymers is of the order of 10 to the 4 bits. So here we can start to smell the idea of having 1 bit per base pair, 
because it was, as I was showing you before, uh, the, these experiments were done with um, uh, DNA strands of the order of 10 to 100 uh, kilobase pair. So you are slightly approaching the chemical specificity, although you are not yet there. And now we are, uh, yeah, okay, this is techno. So now what we are doing, we are running longer and longer polymer, and we, are, we have done some, in fact, uh, showcase simulation on the blue gene in uh, Yorktown Heights. In fact, we are just preparing packaging a paper for the, there is a competition, annual competition in uh, supercomputing, which is Gordon Bell. And uh, we are applying for this uh, contest, uh, not because we are getting the top uh, performance, I will tell you how much we get, but because we think that this is really an innovative kind of application. There are not that many real multi-scale uh, codes around, which would uh, uh, you know, simulate uh, realistic, uh, realistic uh, situation. So what we do, we, make, we are making our appointments real long, as you see. And and in principle, that also ties up with what I was saying yesterday. In some point, we would like to have, for instance, far away from the hole, which is where the important thing happens. Maybe we can survive a long time with the anonymous polymer. But as we get close and down into the hole, for sure it would be nice to reveal the chemical identity of the polymer, because that's certainly important uh, in terms of interaction with the pore, inside the pore. And that's something we cannot afford yet. So if I had to do yet another level of multi-scale, I would keep the polymer as is here, and I would open up the chemistry only there. And this is the methods we were discussing or uh, commenting on, uh, I think, two lectures ago. That would be beautiful, something we, we should do. But mm, take some time. So and this is precisely the showcase we are preparing these days for the, this is the blue gene in Yorktown Heights. I think we have, we have been having up to 32. The largest machine I think is in Livermore and it is four times larger, okay? So scale, the scaling is just wonderful. I'm sorry, I didn't put the, 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 the picture, the, but the performance in terms of scalability is just wonderful. Really. Lattice Bolson is even super linear. So. Uh, and this we expected. The fact that the molecular dynamics is also scaling well only goes to the credit of Simone and Massimo who did an excellent job because molecular dynamics is not an easy object to parallelize. So at the end of the day, what the typical figures we get, this looks like a foam, but in fact this is a membrane with 64 holes. So it's a little piece of, a, you can think of a small portion of a cell membrane. So there are 64 holes and this foam are 64 DNA strands. Each of these is, I guess, 16K, 16,000 bits. So it starts to be kind of serious kind of calculation. Eh? You don't see that many around. I did this type of the thing. I think, frankly speaking, this is a unique calculation. So that's why the sensation is that you have just a tangle of, 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 of polymers. And of course, you study how they go through uh, in time. And this is approaching the final state. As you see now, the, the, this is the, um, where the translocation starts. And as the translocation proceeds, of course, this chamber is depleting. And you see this sort of flower structure, because now is the, this part, the, the membrane is here. So this part is getting dense, and this part is, is flowering. So just to get uh, an idea, we decided that our showcase is still the grid is of the order of a billion, even less, it's one eighth of a billion, and we have, as I said, 64 holes, 16 kilobits per hole, so that amounts to 256,000 bits. And the gross figures that we get is basically this. Uh, we, back, we, we get about 10 teraflops per second, which is, as an absolute uh, fi figure, is not that impressive. Uh, the people who won the Gordon Bell contest for performance last year, uh, they got more than 10 times of this picture because they got uh, basically 60% of the peak. But this was a very highly tuned application. It's quantum chemistry, and they, their code is just a series of libraries. So they have libraries, is uh, just basically a Fourier, fast Fourier transform, ma uh, linear algebra, so it's really a, a very professional assembly of libraries. And in that respect, we are simple people. I mean, we don't have libraries. The Lattice Boltzmann is 
just a few floating point operations, and memory access is, is a crucial. Here. But we cannot rely upon canned software. So uh, the reason why we don't get a significant fraction of the peak is because on a single processor, we don't get the fraction, a significant fraction of the peak. And this would take me to technical issues related to the memory organization of risk machines, and I would spare you with that. But uh, nonetheless, two impressive things uh, definitely are achieved. In the first place, the scalability. In other words, by moving to 10,000 processors, the parallel scalability is achieved, which is great. And also, the fact that we are multi-scale, our uh, time step is of the order of 100, uh, 200 femtosecond, uh, which means that in one day CPU of the largest blue gene, not this one, the one which is, say, 100,000 processors, so in one day CPU of this machine, we could run a system which is 10 micron in size over a, a few milliseconds. So uh, if you compare, and the comparison is not fair, but just to, give a, to have an idea, if you do the same simulation full atom, full atom means that the polymer, of course, is molecular dynamics, but the solvent would be molecular dynamics too. Uh, this would be at best 10 nanosecond, and this would be at best one micron. So there is definitely an effect of this multi-scale. Of course, we could spend hours and days asking, are you realistic? How realistic are, how realistic are you? And that's, of course, a, a, an intellectual challenge. We have to make sure that our model is realistic. But if you do a good job on the science side, uh, really you can access scales which are significantly larger than those uh, accessible by molecular dynamics. So I think this is a very exciting direction. It takes a lot of work, but, uh, but, but it's really interesting. And I think uh, and I hope that in a matter of probably, I don't know, a few years, uh, one will be able to reach sizes where as I was saying before, you can try to think in terms of chemical specificity. Yeah. And that's yeah. Yeah. The lattice Boltzmann, if uh, 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 the translation is the following: we uh, we count, we estimate, and the hardware counts goes with the estimate about 200 uh, uh, floating point per site per step. And so now you have to translate that. Uh, which which unit do you want to have? Lattice Boltzmann size updates per second. Okay, let's do the calculation. It's a nice way of concluding the. Let's do the exercise. So let's do it. We have 200 float floating point operation per side per time step. Okay. Fine. And then we have. 1, 8, 10 to 9 sides. Yeah, we do the same time. But this is uh, 10 teraflops is the aggregate. Okay. So when you say that you are having 200 point This is only lattice ball. This is only lattice ball. Yes. You are yes. showing molecular dynamics. Yes. So I don't think, uh, Simon, maybe you. Yeah, but now I don't remember. In fact, we have the site, and also we need the time. Let's assume that we have 10 teraflops, yes, just for lattice balls. Lattice balls would give probably more. So now we can do the calculation, I think, because. Um, uh, divide by 200, and it's 50 yeah. billion lattice balls from sites per time um, per, per second. Per second, yes. Now, because and well, how many processors is this? Then? This is on thirty-two kilo processors. Yeah, as Tim, Tim says, you have to divide because you have uh, so flop, flop per site, then you divide by the number of sites. No, you multiply by the number of sites. Pardon? 50 billion site time step per second. That's right. Okay. So you take but this and you multiply by this, and you get the flop per second, right? And now if you divide that to get 
But these is a 32K. Per second per processor, yeah. you would divide that by 32K. Right. No, no, this is the aggregate uh, 32,000 processor. Yep. Yeah, but on yeah. each processor. And uh, each processor, yeah. 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 In other words, no, each processor is not that powerful. The processor, a single processor of the blue gene is, uh, what, eight, 800 uh, uh, megahertz. Yeah, it's not. So, so the, the single processor is not yeah, that impressive. Now, now Bruce is trouble because you've got a little over a million. It's, it's over a million. Per processor. Yeah. But that includes the MD. Right. So, so right. Yeah. MD makes it quite a lot. Huh? Yeah. Very is it, do you know where it's spending most of its time if you profile no. the code? If you profile, they spend 50% of the time both for this showcase. Uh -huh. But the flop shot, I think, with molecular energy is one of the magnitude smaller than flat force. Yeah. I see. I think it's impressive to see what I thought. I never heard of something so far. But that's why. Uh, well, uh, as I say, if you go into the last year contest, the winner had. Oh, for Latin Bolson? Ah, no, for Latin Bolson. No, no, but this Latin Bolson is very, is very highly tuned. Very highly tuned. Any you know, operation you could do, so it's been really good. Yeah, they've really been stealing cycles everywhere, you know, merging collision and streaming and mm -hmm. a lot of things behind that. No, no, I th that's why we are very happy with this package. That otherwise, we would not uh, even try to run for this contest. But now, no matter whether we get it or not, I think this is a really an interesting setup. And I think the most exciting thing is that if the day they gave they give us uh, a larger machine, that is also we, we will keep going, no question. Molecular dynamics by some, uh, I wouldn't say miracle, but some clever doing by Simone has been really using all uh, his uh, armory of tricks, uh, and he could speed it up. I think you got in the last couple of weeks at least a factor two. We are lucky here that they do molecular dynamics. There is one uh, good circumstance. They do molecular dynamics at atomic scales. Usually you have long range interaction as compared to your domain decomposition. And that, that is uh, quite a large overhead, which would make your code saturate a large number of processes. Here, the interaction is very short range. It, it's in the nature of the coarse grain procedure. It's rather short range. That means that you can play tricks to optimize all these machines. Linked list, all these kind of things. Yeah, linked list. We do some telescopic linked list, whatever, but it's, it, that's what helps you. If you do, you know, all atom or dynamics, then you, you would never, I think there's only one code, NAND, which achieves very good scalability. In Los Alamos. I know, that's uh, Urbana. Urbana. No, Urbana. That achieves uh, scalability up to you know ten thousand processors. No other code does that. Mm -hmm. But here we can still uh, gain. I mean, I think even higher than thirty thousand because of this uh, circumstance. Okay. How do you deal with the dielectric properties of the solvent of the water? There is no dielectric here. So the water, as Sarah was saying, water here is a hydrodynamic solvent, and all the uh, water is really a gas, isn't it? Well, in a way, it's in the nature of a liquid, it's basically incompressible. So that's what we do here. So right. density is basically constant. Well, that's just because of Mach numbers. What? The system is fully compressible, correct? In density? Well, air, <coughs> air is incompressible at low Mach numbers, so that's the trick. Yeah, yeah. No, no. The thing oh, is, yeah. the well, thing is just the same. If you want, yes. In the view of the equation of state, I mean, the equation of state of a liquid, you basically have a, a, a you know, compressible liquid. So, yeah, of course, here the velocities are small. So. But the, di the dielectric of water is so high that I would have thought that was one of the more important yeah. physical yeah, effects. Right. Actually, yeah, that was right. the question that uh, he asked before. Here, you're lumping all the um, electrical properties of DNA because DNA is a strong poly electrolyte, so you, you would have long-range interactions. But luckily, when you do you know, the polymer um, treatment of our DNA, you can lump about 150 base pairs in one effective bead. That's, that's what is called, 150 base pairs is what is called the persistent length. So, so everything can be... So that the bi length is smaller than that. Yeah, the, the bi length is smaller than that. So everything becomes local. And that's the course when you do on the, on the But I think DNA. Bruce still has a point, Simone. I think we, and I think that would be a very nice exercise, independent of our... Yeah, locally you can have... A Just make water a kind of ferrofluid or polar, so that it has some dipole and it can interact with the monomer, with the polymer based on the, on the dipole. 
So one should enrich the lattice. So, and then you get the natural screening of the electrostatic. And, yeah, it's probably not so easy to do. Uh, why not? Because the polarizer goes through it. That's why you well, I, I would, naively, I would think just of this population, and they carry also some uh, internal degrees of freedom, which would be the dipole orientation. You said that the Debye length is longer than? Smaller, smaller. Shorter. So, shorter. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see. So, when you, okay. the polymer statistics, you say a persistent length yeah. is wherever there is no more orientational correlation of the, of the, of the chain. So since so you're coarser you, than that, you can argue that right, the screening is not. At the shorter right. length, say the polymer is still rigid. It's like a, you know, a semi-flexible rod. Uh -huh. When it's very short distance, it's really hard. It's a hard rod. So now if you go long enough, then the traction has decayed uh, to zero, basically, and everything is very flexible. So it, your effective bit here is taking into account of this 150. I see. Okay, that's what you do. So, of course, there are plenty of approximation, but still, uh, I think uh, it's an interesting role. It's a, it's a long-term project. So this is just a whole list of um, wish list, in fact. Uh, temperature effects, I think, is something we sh should be able to study relatively. Simple electric field effects, which means um, how does the translocation time as you change the strength of the electric field. And this, uh, here there is a lot of theoretical work, electrostatic interaction. I think the code has a module which does a Vlas of Poisson, but uh, I, that one is not parallelized, I guess. In the serial version, there is a module. Uh, I, mean, I guess one question just to follow up on this other point is which uh, physical properties of the water are you getting correct with the last Boltzmann fluid? Well, actually, the solvent in itself is a hydrodynamic, so you're getting hydrodynamics correctly, but... Well, if, but no, no, but what's the Reynolds number, of viscosity, or whatever you imagine? Oh, the Reynolds number is miserable. It's 10 to minus 5, yeah. And in the simulation, it's more than that, 10 to minus 3. In fact, we have the opposite right, so pro so We have the anti-turbulence so problem. The Reynolds number. We have the anti-turbulence problem. We, we cannot make the Reynolds numbers small enough. That's because why otherwise the viscosity. You can make the Reynolds numbers. <laughs> you can always dial up the viscosity. That's easy. No, because our viscosity gets too big. If you put down the number, the lattice both on viscosity. The, the, so you're not matching the viscosity. It's too big? <laughs> what you, no. What do you mean? No. I'm sorry. We, we can. Can. No, Which no, physical no. properties of the liquid are the you viscosity. matching? The viscosity. You are matching the viscosity. Yeah. But the Reynolds is larger than what it should be. Yeah. So if you, you cannot match all the physical parameters. If you match the viscosity, for instance, the gamma, the well, friction. Which ones no are you matching? Viscosity we can. If we decide that we fix the viscosity, we have it. But then we lose something else. The gamma, the gamma V minus U. Gamma is femtosecond. I mean, these you have to, you cannot resolve gamma, gamma minus one. Right? Well, I, I don't know. I no, no, I tell you. You match the viscosity, you match the Reynolds number, unless the scale's wrong, so I don't quite understand. The velocity. No, no, yeah, you're number. right. If we decide that we want the Reynolds number, fine. We have the viscosity, and we have the viscosity 10 to the minus 6 uh, meters per square per second. Fine. But then this fixes our delta t, and the our delta t is way larger than what you would need to resolve gamma minus 1, because friction is too fast. Gamma minus 1. Is the friction the with the polymer with the water. This is not damping of your monomer in the, in the oh, solution. Oh, you're modeling that as opposed to simulating. Now you want to get a physical number for that. Uh, yeah. Which means that at that scale, well, giving in, you know, the, the motion of a or a colloid, whatever you want, at that scale, would be really overdone. That, that what you get with the, with the calculation. They, they, I mean, they, they, they well, I guess I misunderstood. I mean, I thought the point would have been to, to model the drag processes with the correct description of the solvent. So you're saying you're modeling the friction some other way? I mean, I mean if, the, if the solvent description is physically valid, and I don't know whether you were here in the beginning. You ought to generate the right friction. Right. Say you use the Stokes law to get the friction, which is in this case the coupling between solvent and fluid. So it's it's basically the same. That's the one. Okay. Maybe we were not yet in when we discussed that right. gamma I was mentioning. This is the monomer motion. So this gamma is the fastest scale. It's very very large. But you do estimate that gamma with Stokes 
So you would get a, a very large gamma that would make your simulation. But those were the consequence of the fluid. Yeah, this comes in. And, and size, size, size of your particle. Size, so something's not matching. Right. So you're modeling this empirically. We have to make it small. No, I'll show it. Well, that's basically because, you know, here we have inertia. So we allow trajectories of particles to be smoother. If you go into the overdump limit, you would have really you know, big kicks into the solvent, so the simulation would be unstable. Overdump means that V, you set V equal to U, and then you integrate only this one, because gamma is very fast. What's new, what's new and what's new? Sorry, as this is the velocity of the particle P, okay. and U is the fluid velocity interpolated in this location. So that's the frictional drag of the fluid onto the polymer. So it's a kind of uh, Langevin plus, this is stochastic noise. So it's the Langevin equation right. with momentum conservation. It, your intuition completely fails in this regime. There was a great paper years ago called Life at Low Reynolds Number by Purcell from here. Ah, and yes, yes. He talks about what life is like for tiny one-celled organisms in water and it's it's as though if you were in a swimming pool filled with molasses and you were allowed to move your arms at only one centimeter per second maximum and your goal was to go 10 feet in two weeks that's what life is like for these creatures and this is much smaller still right so there's no inertia at all the moment you stop doing anything yeah, and then they have to tumble, deform, yeah. and all kind of stuff. Noise prevails. Noise prevails. Yeah. It's just like a car in an hurricane, I guess. More or less, the scale is the same. So. Well, I was just trying to understand what the, what the solid is doing in the model. I guess it's absorbing a momentum to some extent. Yeah. But, it's, but the way it's doing mm -hmm. that is it's stuck in. It's not derived from the correct solvent hydrodynamics, which I've assumed it was. Sorry, once again, Kim, what are you saying? The interaction between the polymer and the liquid is put in empirically using the, the Stokes law and that formula for the yeah. size of the beads or whatever is put in yeah. or new, right? It's not in other words, you, from a no. correct treatment of the yeah. solvent fluid dynamics. Well, may I add something? I mean, maybe that's adequate. I'm, I'm no, it's simply uh, up to a certain point. We have been working in the past with Southwell on the Fokker Planck type of equation, which is Galilean invariant, and then you can demonstrate that this gives rise to Navier Stokes. And basically, what you get in that operator, which is not BGK, it's a, just a different operator, but it gives rise to Navier Stokes. The incarnation of that operator is that is in that the the you can say that in it, I guess, right? Incarnation. Yes. In this gamma v minus u, yeah. it's the same thing. So you can drive hydrodynamics out of a different operator rather, rather than BGK or you know full Boltzmann, and this is basically what we're doing. We are integrating the trajectory of a Fokker Planck type of equation, yeah. which is Galilean. Well, I guess I believe you can probably get that out of a full Boltzmann operator as well when the distributions are. Well, yeah. I mean, in a, in a way, what you're saying is you can derive Stokes drag from the Navier-Stokes equation, so you yeah, would expect that to be an emergent property time. rather than an input yeah. property. But on the other hand, these molecules have only four lattice Boltzmann sites around them, so they're very, it's a very under-resolved neighborhood around the molecule. But well, if you want to describe the interaction well, of real there's water no, molecules... no consequence of the neighboring beads on the trailing beads and so on. And Pattern. The, the beads are treated independently from the standpoint of the No, no, the beads are right. The beads have some potential. No, no, the bead bead interaction, yeah. but not the, not the bead water, not the bead solvent interaction. Ah, no, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I think what the, the I mean, you, what you would like to see some specific interaction of the water molecule with the blue ball, that's what you mean. Well, I was just trying to understand what was No, that, that would be the next level, I think. Probably no, no, it, I think Kim is those right. Those forces, those interactions are computed to a low resolution. That's what you're, what you're saying. But you can go higher with, you know, high order interpolation issues. The point here is, uh, since both lattice balls and, and, and molecular dynamics are, you know, second order, accurate in space and time, yeah. so you need to go to very high accuracy in those local interactions, or you can keep it with low, low order. Uh, here we do a simple, simple interpolation scheme, but 
People yeah. have tried to do higher order interference, didn't see changes. No, but so I, I think, uh, Simone, if I understand correctly, I think King's um, question is more to the f physical nature of the interaction between water, common, common, and the polymer here, which is very, very uh, stylized in our yeah. case. I mean, Stokes' laws for a sphere, right? Sure. Stokes' laws. So you're assuming every one of these hundred, what did you tell, tell me? It was a hundred base pairs or something that yeah. bumped into a bead, right. and that's treated as a sphere for the purposes of calculating right. the drag. And furthermore, all those spheres, all those beads along the chain are independent of one another. Right. Of course. Now, that may be true at low kernels. That's what people have done. They have really computed the Stokes drag for DNA and uh, well, doing uh, both theoretical and experimental work. And that number is, uh, is known, that gamma is known. Right, it's known for a sphere, but it's different for a football or a block of wood or That's blah, right. blah, 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 blah. And those molecules yeah. are nothing like spheres. Actually, no, it's, it's an, more like, if you want to look into it, it's more like an ellipsoid. That's what, because you have, uh, you know. Well, the beautiful paper, I think, on nature, on the effect of the shape, yeah. ellipsoid versus sphere, I don't know. Yeah. But somehow, I, I guess this is the point to do a multi-scale, multi-physics simulation. Because what you say is you, you should do the simulation just based on molecular dynamic into every water molecule, but that would just be too expensive. Well, I wasn't advocating anything. I was just trying to understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. Oh, you do some modeling here. There's no, I, mean, there's no I think at certain points, you would need more realism. I think inside the pore, for instance, you would need more realism. So water cannot be kept. I think I got this question, uh, this point, again, by the, when I said, oh, now we have one bit per base pair, so we can open the base pair. And, it's, and the, the other objection I got, OK, by the time you do that, you cannot keep water that simple. I think that's more or less in the spirit of Kim. So I think our luck is both on model. When we really go serious about nanometers, should be enriched somehow. Because we cannot open up the polymer and leave water down, down me or as simple as it is now. And how to enrich that, I think, is a beautiful problem. I have no answer. If I had to do it now, I would just put some internal degrees of freedom. But maybe this is not enough. Mm -hmm. I think polarizability is the first thing that people mention. Water is a nasty beast. I mean, in molecular oh, terms is a very No, in molecular terms is a So you, there is no way to I mean, Maybe you uh, can model Leonard Jones fluid with some you know, success. But just to have a smell of it. But water is out of question, I think. <laughs> the state of the art. Well, that's so, yeah, you mean the, the chemical. Thermodynamics, chemical the interaction, water. hydrogen yeah, bonds, yeah. whatever happens, look at it. You know, fast rotational motion, whatever is happening in water. Yeah, water. I mean, when you, when you bring in a chemical interaction between water and uh, your beads or base pairs, whatever they are, that completely invalidates the Stokes track, right, doesn't it? Wouldn't that change the... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Totally. But nobody knows. Nobody knows, I guess. Anyway, so I think we are... Just, just to give you an idea, sorry. People have done at the molecular level calculations of uh, Leonard Jones fluid. So just a simple thing. That's, oh, that's not water either, right? That's not water either. <laughs> and and even at that case, they've, they've been questioning for the last 20 years if, you know, no slip versus free slip boundary right. condition is still valid. So it's a kind of worms, you know. It's, yeah. If you do water, no way. So I mean, so the the, the game is not over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so okay, so this concludes this series of lecture. I really would like to thank you all for being here. It has been to me very enjoyable experience, and and I thank the senior people, Kim and, and Bruce, who took the time to be here. I know that they have busy agendas, and that's not easy. And so I'm very thankful for that. I was discussing yesterday with Elaine, and basically I presented half of the material I prepared for, which is really a very nice thing to me. It means that we had a lot of interaction. So we are thinking of maybe having a second pass. The leftover is basically, I wanted to mention a little bit about the way we do turbulence, which would be, I think, uh, uh, resonate a lot with the scheme. And I still wanted to show an exercise on how you couple molecular dynamics and another Stokes, which is possibly the streamlined today of, of uh, complex fluid multi-scale simulation, although we do it in a different way. 
And uh, also, I think I had a lecture, an abstract lecture, on how you do the mathematical formulation of problems where the cross correlation don't uh, wipe out. Uh, I, had that, I had planned that as a third lecture, but since last week we had, in my opinion, too much theory, I just skipped it. But I think in a second pass it would be useful to see why multiscale feels kind of conceptual all, because when you have multiscale problem and cross correlation which don't die out, all mathematical methods I know of, sooner or later they fail. So if uh, there is an interest in this uh, further material, plus the Chimera method, the method by these people who, who open up the polymers in the vicinity of the, and that's a beautiful mathematics. In fact, they are dynamical system where the, uh, the dimensionality of phase space goes up and down. It's really beautiful stuff. So if you're interested in that, and uh, possibly you can have a second pass of this uh, series, hopefully before the summer. And I think Elaine will ask, will, will send out a kind of questionnaire. On my side, I would be pleased to do so because, as I said, I, I put some work in preparing this, but it was really nice and rewarding. So I thank you all for being here.